Welcome, everybody, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are at. This presentation is coming to you, to you from, um, from Indian country. And I, we'd like to acknowledge the lands that everyone is representing here in this presentation. Uh, the Catawba uh, lands for Stephanie Brooks, the Onondaga lands for Jason Marshall, the Coast Salish lands for Deanna Kennedy, and for the PhD project, the Lenape lands. And I come to, to you from the Tewa lands. Blaine. Okay. Thanks, Joe. And welcome, everyone. My name is Blaine Rushak. I think I have a header slide, Christina. But I'm the president of the PhD project and excited to be here today to talk about you know, what the PhD project is and then you'll learn uh, more from our esteemed panelists about getting a PhD and what that means. Um, so, you know, I've been the president of the PhD project for a little over a year and a half, but the project has been around for 26 years. Um, it started back in 94 because there was a, a identified lack of diversity in business schools. Right. Uh, so, you know, rather than just firms trying to come up with new programs to, you know, take that existing pool of people and move them around different firms, the KPMG Foundation and three other, you know, pilot partners started a program called the PhD Project. And the mission was pretty simple. Encourage professionals or students um, that were successful in their either academic or professional careers to go get a PhD and then become that role model in the classroom, that mentor to students, that academic leader, whether it's as a chair or dean or other administrative position, um, including up to the provost and university president position. So that was the, the goal. 26 years later, we're happy to say that we have quintupled the number of um, diverse faculty. And when we define diverse for the PhD project, it's Black and African-American, Hispanic, Latinx, and Native American Indian. So that's what we have focused it on. Um, and we're really excited about the results, but know there's a lot more work to do. H hence why we're doing these programs. I encourage hopefully many of you to consider this path, whether it be now or in the future, to get your PhD. Right, next slide, Christina. Um, so I, I talked about the population that we encourage. Who does it? This is the, the, the list of, of mentors or sponsors that have been partners with the PhD project, um, including at the bottom there, in a little small print, over 300 universities participate. They believe in the PhD project, so they are members of the PhD project. They recruit from our members that are students that are going through the PhD project um, and support the importance of diversity by bringing in um, diverse faculty onto their campuses. Next slide, Christina. So uh, here was our goal, and it's about equity. It's about trying to make sure that students, you know, see that they have a career path in any discipline that they, they, they are interested in, that they're not precluded from going into disciplines. And we focus on the business disciplines. So accounting, finance, information systems, marketing, you know, management. Um, so, you know, we focus on the business disciplines to make sure that students know that they can go into those disciplines, that they can have a successful career. Um, probably if we had our, you know, perfect world, we'd encourage students like yourselves, you know, professionals like yourself to go get their PhD um, or to go get their degree in business, work and, you know, um, go back and get their PhD and actually serve as a role model classroom. So kind of the full cycle of going from student to professional back to them being in that in the academic world. Next slide, Christina. So this is a slide that shows the, the really um, disparate, you know, mix of, of students and faculty you know, on the diversity landscape in terms of the percentage. Um, and, you know, so there, there's, there's work to be done. And even though you can look at the, um, the Native American Indian um, percentages there, while they may be close, they're also very small. And our goal is we have to increase those numbers in the student and faculty rank. So we encourage, you know, everyone that's called to consider, you know, what this might mean for you, either in, in getting a business degree or getting a PhD you know, down the road and becoming that academic role model. Next slide, Christina. Here's the, the, the numbers. You can see that in some of the disciplines, you know, actually have done a, a decent job of, of having a Native American Indians in front of the, the classroom and being faculty or leaders on their campuses. 
um, some of which you'll hear from today on the panel. Um, but you can see we're, we're, we're kind of slow on the student side right now with only six students currently in the pipeline. You know, we'd love to see every discipline have numbers and we'd love to get those numbers higher. So hopefully, you know, sessions like these that are informational um, outreach sessions, you know, will help, you know, drive some additional, um, you know, information. And I know you'll hear about the November conference, which we're happy to say will be live this year. So listen closely because we really want to encourage people to come to that conference. I, I only went a few times myself and I will say it was pretty, um, I'll call it life changing, just hearing, you know, the excitement, the enthusiasm. So hopefully your panelists will give you, you know, excited and interested in maybe applying for that November conference when the time is right for you. Next slide, Christina. Impact. I mean, that's what this program is all about. And you, you may think, well, how can I make an impact if I just quit my PhD? Uh, how's that going to make a difference? Well, think about it. If, if you get your PhD and then become a professor, and let's say for simplicity, you teach two classes in the fall and two in the spring, and each of those classes has 50 students, right? So it's 100 students in the fall, 100 in the spring. So, you know, 200 for the year. But then you teach for, you know, 20 years, right? That's 4,000 students that you directly impacted. And then think about the impact that they then take. So they, you impacted them. They decided, you know, I really want to pursue this career. They talk to people about their career and their, their excitement, and they encourage people, um, as well as, you know, when you move into a possibly an administrative role as a chair or a dean or a provost, having more impact. You get involved in student and faculty organizations. So huge impact to be made you know, by pursuing this path. So, you know, I know for a lot of us, you know, we look at what's our purpose and passion that we have, and I think you'll find that getting your PhD and being that that academic um, could provide that passion and purpose that many of us strive to to achieve. Um, and I, I will say, as serving as adjunct faculty in a number of schools, it definitely has been a passion for me. So, um, with no further ado, I know you got a great panel. I want to make sure I don't take away from their time. So, Joe and panel, thank you for allowing me to to be part of your session today and and welcome the team. And I'll be, be listening on to hear all the, the great uh, ideas you're going to give them. And hopefully we'll see some of these at the November conference. So uh, thanks again. Joe, I don't think we can hear you. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. We're going to try that again, technology and buttons. Again, thank you, Blaine, and thank you to the PhD Project for giving me the honor and privilege to share my story with you. Uh, Nisto, Joe Gladstone, uh, Nisto Kanekwan, Fikanekwan Fi Nimipu. I am an incoming assistant professor at Washington State University Everett Campus, and I'll be starting there in August. I have been a professor uh, for the past uh, decade now, earning my PhD in Business Administration Management at New Mexico State University, where I focused on uh, American Indians. Um, my work is my passion, and I'll share uh, more about my passion during the discussion. Um, but I want to talk to you more about what it means to become a business professor. And after this short introduction on being a professor, I will enter, um, will, uh, hear from my friends and colleagues, Jason Marshall, Stephanie Lawson-Brooks, and Deanna Kennedy. So let's, what about this role of a business professor? What does a business professor do? And that's what our next slide is going to kind of give you an overview of. Oops, I'm a little bit synchrony. There we go. Sorry about that. So what is a business professor? Well, most people who, and many of you who are probably undergrads right now or have been in college, see business professors as the person in front of the classroom, the person who teaches, teaches you business, teaches you whatever it is you studied in school. And we do much more than that, actually. We not only teach you knowledge, but we actually teach the knowledge that we generate. Um, business professors at the PhD level are trained to ask questions and find answers to those questions. We create knowledge through theory development and academic field research. And we share our knowledge that we discover through journals and in the classroom and to our communities. We also provide service to our universities and especially for Indian country, service to a greater community. So next slide we're gonna look at we ask, what are the attributes of an academic career? And that is, what's the good thing about being a professor? Well, one of the greatest things is that you get to make differences in the lives of others. As Blaine had mentioned earlier, 
we have impact. Uh, if you recall that slide, you see one professor reaches some students and those students go out in the world and they reach their workers, they reach their friends. We spread our knowledge, we share it. That's how we create the impact, by sharing our ideas, our wisdom, our knowledge, and what we generate through our research and what we learn from our communities. We pass that down to other people, and not just Native people, but to people throughout the world. Um, so that's the greatest thing, is we make differences in lives of others and our communities. Of course, there are some good things about being a professor, especially a business professor. Salary is pretty good salary. And when for those contemplating, well, what's it like being a professor? I work nine months out of the year, and that means I get my summers off. But when you think about it, I also get winter break, and I get a week off in Thanksgiving, and I get a week off in the spring. So basically, I work eight months a year. And then out of that, yeah, I work four days a week. Of course, this varies for different schools. But good opportunities. If you are a person who likes your individuality, your own control of your life, you will be able to share your knowledge with others. This is actually a really good job. Very good work-life balance, as we'll hear from <coughs> others in the panel. It, I, especially now in the days of COVID, and we'll see where things go. If you're a type of professor who gets to teach online, you get to stay home and you get to spend time, a lot of quality time with your family. And for those who have young children and thinking about our, our youth growing up and who they'll become, you get to be a role model for those children. And you also get to be a role model for other youth in the community as an academic leader. The problem is, is that there is, there is a great need for professors in the United States, especially American Indian professors. There are only a small group of us uh, professors in all disciplines. And we need more Native American professors. Um, as I always like to joke when we have a PhD project conference, um, my dream is to see us fill more than one table at that conference. And this is why we're here today, to help you consider joining us as faculty. There's geographic choices. You get to work wherever you want. I actually work globally. I have colleagues in Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and we're working on joint projects together. I've traveled and shared, shared my work in Canada and in Australia. And it's a good stable job. I mean, it's, you know, it's especially for those on the tenure track, you pretty much are guaranteed a job for life after you earn tenure, but that's evolving too. Um, we can share more about that in a little bit. And of course, intellectual stimulation. The, if you think about it, how many times have someone called you a nerd? And what exactly is a nerd? Well, it's just a person who's intellectually curious. What is the difference between a nerd and a person who holds a PhD? A PhD holder is simply a nerd with a license. So if you're a very curious person, you want to learn more, what makes these things tick, especially in Indian country, we can teach you how to explore that and do you know, fulfill your passion and satisfy your curiosity. So what are the paths to a PhD in business? And that'll be the next slide here. There are different ways to get a PhD. The most traditional way is you earn your undergraduate degree, your bachelor's degree, you go on and get a master's degree, and then you pursue your PhD in business. And after that, um, you get to become a professor. There's other ways, and this is more my route. Um, you get your undergraduate degree, you work in the field for a little while, and you see your work in the field inspire you to get your master's degree. And then as I'll share more, my master's degree inspired me to get my PhD in business. However, you do not need to take the master's degree route. You can actually, especially for those outstanding students that you know, we identify that have that potential to join this doctoral club, you can go straight from your undergraduate degree into a PhD program. And so what is the doctoral program process, which is our next slide. And so we have our coursework, we have our pre-dissertation research, we have exams and dissertation. And so basic coursework, you get to you, you learn what you need to learn in the discipline. We teach you business. If you're in management, you learn management. If you're in marketing, you learn marketing. You have to have this knowledge to be able to share it in the classroom. And then we teach you how to ask questions and answer them. And that's your pre-dissertation uh, research. And then we test you on everything to see what, how well you know things. And then you do your studies, your dissertation. At this level, you're pretty much a member of the club. We see you more as an apprentice than a student. So what skills do you need then? 
to be a uh, to be in a doctoral program, be a professor. You have quantitative skills, which are the numerical studies and statistics and mathematics. Mind you, you don't. There are different ways to explore things, and I'll share that more. You need the qualitative skill, which is the non-numeric, the, the storytelling methods. And you can explore things through storytelling as well as the numerical methods. But being able to write, that's important because you have to share the things you discover and be able to communicate them to all types of people. All right, next slide. All right. So I think we are at... Yep, this is it. Sorry about that. So after this slide here, we're gonna we're gonna talk to uh, our colleagues here. But basically, if you're considering joining this program, could you cut? Could you cut it? Do you think you can? You're good enough. Actually, very likely you are. You just need to know how to do it, and that's what the PhD project is for. We would help you earn your PhD to help you get into a program to help you succeed through a program and help you become a professor. And our results uh, show it. Uh, we've increased the numbers of minority faculty in business schools by a great amount from 1994, 294 people to 2021, we have 1,387 professors with an asterisk. Um, so we've increased the number of minority faculty students at business schools. And that's the key thing. In order to, in order to diversify, America, uh, business schools, we need to increase the pool of faculties to choose from. And that's why we exist as a PhD project. We have a very high success rate in completion. Our students come through our program, we support them. We teach them how to be a student, how to be a doctoral candidate. And, and our, our numbers show we produce very good professors. So should you join us and, and go through this challenge, you'll leave being an outstanding professor that schools will want. And now, let me confirm one thing. It's time to meet our panelists. And so our next slide will have Jason Marshall, but rather than me do the introduction, Jason knows himself best. And so my friend, Jason Marshall. All right, thanks Joe. And thanks for joining us, uh, everybody. It's so weird just seeing those panelists here on the screen. I'm, I'm looking for the feedback from the audience and, and there is none. So um, yeah, my name is Jason Marshall. I am a fourth year PhD candidate at Binghamton University and member of the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians uh, from Northern Michigan is where I come from. Uh, I took the longest route possible to a PhD, uh, one that Joe didn't even cover in that slide. And so I, I had undergrad in criminal justice and then worked for my tribe as a tribal police officer for six years and was lacking that intellectual stimulation that, that Joe referenced. And so I went back to school and did an MBA and that piqued some curiosity and started my journey down leadership consulting. And so I had my own leadership consulting firm for um, six years, I did leadership consulting and the curiosity just kept coming at me. And, and I, I, my ability to answer those questions was lacking. And so, the next logical step for me was figure out how to answer those questions that kept coming at me around leadership and management. And so uh, I attended the 2015 PhD project conference and still wasn't sold. It, it took me three years to finally take the leap of faith that, to join the program. And so in 2018, I joined the PhD program here at Binghamton University and I'm absolutely loving it. It's challenging, but I, I found my my space in, in life. And so I'm loving the journey and hope I get a chance to share some uh, some of my experiences and tips and tricks along the way. So um, Stephanie, I'd like to pass it on to you. Hi everyone, my name is Stephanie Lawson Brooks. I am um, just recently became Associate Dean for Graduate Programs and Accreditation at Winthrop University. And I'm also an Associate Professor of Marketing. I got my PhD at Florida State University and I kind of took a, you know, maybe a path that a lot of you might take, which is I got my undergraduate degree. I worked for about 10 years um, in marketing research and also just in marketing in general. I was a marketing manager for a little while, um, but I had that same thing that Jason was talking about, just always like, but I have this question. Why can't I do this? You know, why isn't anybody reading these white papers they're making me write at work? Um, and so one day I ended up talking to one of my MBA professors just kind of about wanting to maybe teach a, as an adjunct at some point. And he was like, why don't you apply to the PhD program? And I was like, oh, 
So I actually ended up finding out about PhD project from him. Um, Florida State has a pretty active um, contingent of faculty and students um, involved with PhD project. And so I went to the conference and kind of the rest is history. I started my PhD the next year. Um, it was a really big leap of faith because it was right in the beginning of the recession. Um, but it's been awesome and a great experience and I wouldn't trade it for anything. So looking forward to sharing some experiences with you. Deanna. Hey, thank you. So my journey to getting my PhD started, uh, well, uh, it's kind of the circuitous route. I was actually a biology student out of undergrad and I went to work for a company. I thought I was gonna be a lab tech and then uh, they had an opening for a buyer for the lab. And so I said, oh, I'm gonna get into the purchasing side, spending the company's money. So I spent a few years doing that until the company was purchased. And I went back to get my MBA thinking I would be in project management. And I'd worked on project teams at that company. I saw a lot of things go right. I saw a lot of things go wrong. So I took classes in project management. And along with that, I took one research methods class. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I love research methods. I, I think this is so interesting. You can find out so many things. And so I went uh, on the look for a PhD program that included a study, uh, if there was a faculty member studying project teams. And I found one at the University of Massachusetts. And it was like perfect timing about that time. I was like, well, should I go back into the job market after my MBA or uh, go on to get my PhD? And this was 2005. And I got a, a card about the PhD project and it took me to the November conference and I said, this is what I want to do. So that was in 2005. And I started my PhD program at the University of Massachusetts and studying project teams. So that's my primary area of focus. But then as I got going and met my colleagues, we've started to work on uh, different projects about uh, why aren't there more Native American students in business schools? How can we help with the retention uh, and attraction of, of PhD and other uh, MBA business programs to Native American students. So I've been working with Joe and other colleagues uh, on this cause now for, for many years. <laughs> and so I started here at the University of Washington Bothell in 2010. Uh, I came actually, I was at Texas A&M uh, in College Station for a year as a visiting professor and then came here. And now, so even though my degree was in management science, I was a purchasing agent. So my uh, focus has been in operations, in the operations area. So I teach uh, classes in statistics and inventory management and things like that. And, uh, and then recently, uh, last two years, so I also became an associate dean of academics here in the School of Business. So I'll turn it back to Joe. Thank you, Deanna. Um, my story very briefly, it's a long story, so I'll strive to keep it short. And then I have some questions for our panelists to discuss. So as I introduced myself earlier, I'm Joe Gladstone. I'm an enrolled member of the Blackfeet tribe and a descendant of the Nez Perce tribe in Montana and in Idaho. Uh, my work is, or my path, I guess, is similar to Jason's. Uh, I had done a lot of things after my undergraduate degree, which is not in business. I am actually an athletic trainer by undergraduate. So if you sprain your ankle, I can fix it. And then I was also a National Park Ranger. So Jason and I both have the law enforcement experience behind that. Things just happen. Trickster kind of sets things up for you to do things the way things will happen. And I ended up working for tribal health programs and that inspired me to get my master in public health. And my passion has always been the boss. It's kind of the cool thing about, you know, just me. And uh, well, I don't know if that's cool, it's up to other people, but anyways. I liked, I studied boss things and I studied health behavior theory. And then I ended up working for a tribe and I ran a diabetes program. It was in my work in a tribal health that I realized I was treating symptoms of greater economic problems. And we needed to address these economic problems if we're actually going to do anything about the health issues and the social issues that occur on reservations. And I realized that Perhaps for me, the best way to do that is to study business comprehensively and learn how to do research. And that's how I ended up becoming a business professor. I joined the PhD project in 2003, went to what I call Chicago, and we'll share more about that in a little bit. And they taught me everything I needed to uh, know to get to where I am today. My work, I explore tribes. My 
passion is looking at the culture, indigenous culture, what it means to be native, what it, what business means to native people, and then how to develop business education that fits tribal communities. And so that's what I do today. So really quick question for my panelists. And first of all, what tribes do you represent? Deanna? Are you calling me out because I forgot <laughs> to say something? So I did put it in the chat. So I'm a member of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma. Jason? I'm, oh, sorry. Oh, I'm Lumbee from North Carolina. Yeah, and I'm Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians in Michigan. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna throw this one open to Stephanie first and then Stephanie can pass on to the others. So why did you choose to go beyond a bachelor's degree? If you shared a little bit, is there any more you could share about that? You know, I've always been, I mean, I loved school. I mean, that's probably a good place to start. <laughs> I think if you don't love school, you might not love working at a university every day. But I mean, I loved going to school. I love learning things. I'm always that person that's like, oh, did you hear about this thing? I just read about this. And um, so I've always just been that way ever since I was young. And um, I really was not, even though I liked where I worked, I was not stimulated enough. Like I was very bored. Like I would it, I had the Sunday scaries every week because I was like, I can't stand to just go there and be there for eight hours, like when I could be doing so much more, even though I wasn't really sure what the so much more was. Um, and so the next logical step for me was to get a master's because I wanted to get promoted to maybe, maybe that would be intellectually stimulating, you know, and so, but when I was in my master's program, I just wanted to read everything. I was having a really interesting time doing that and I was in a research role at work and um, I worked at for a healthcare um, company at the time and we did have people with PhDs who were working there and doing um, health informatics research and predictive analysis and all these different things and I would kind of go in their meetings and listen to what they were doing because that was more interesting to me um, and so it kind of just led me down this path. Uh, I'm just a very curious person. I always want to know new things. And I think that's probably a very key, important characteristic of somebody who wants to do this job. Deanna, Jason, do you guys, either one of you? Go ahead, Deanna. Okay. I, I would agree that you have to love school. However, I will say like when I was getting my undergraduate degree, I, as I mentioned, I got it in biology. I was not focused. Like I was like, well, maybe a biology, but maybe some part of like, maybe I'm interested in animal science or something. So I ended up staying in undergrad for five and a half years. <laughs> and when I graduated, I was like, I never want to see school again. Like I was done with school for a while. And then I got the job and I was working and I needed to take a class to kind of move up the job scale. And so I went back and I took the class and I'm like, oh, I actually enjoy school again and actually I really miss it and then when I went uh back to get my MBA and I really got into it I'm like I could do this I really en enjoy this I don't know if it was just maybe I wasn't doing the right thing originally but uh but in the end you have to really love school um but you don't have to love it right at this moment know you love it maybe you know go back take a class and see if you love it because it took me going back to school to, to remind me so uh, I'll, I'll clarify, I, I don't think you have to love school. You have to love learning. So I, I never liked school. I didn't like uh, high school. I didn't like undergrad. Uh, and then I went back and did the MBA for some reason. It was that curiosity that led me back to the MBA. And that's where I began to enjoy the process of the learning process in the school environment. And I would stay after class and talk to the professors and then, um, yeah, that curiosity kept me coming back for more. And so I love learning. I've always loved learning. But the, what I found is like, a, it, you can think of it as a funnel. School is so broad at first. You know, you have your gen ed classes. So many of them seem unrelated to what you want to do with your life. And it's like a, maybe a waste of time. You get bored. At least that was the case for me. But then when I went back to the MBA, it narrowed that funnel. And I was like, oh, I kind of, I'm interested in the topics here. Finance, not so much, but, you know, I'm narrowing. Once you get into the PhD, you've narrowed down into doing what you enjoy, what you're interested in. And once you get that narrow, 
is no longer whether or not you like school, you're just in love with learning. And so that's what I found to be the case for me was the narrowing of that funnel uh, led me to the PhD journey. Thank you, Jason. And for me, it's kind of just, uh, I guess I'm gonna go right back to saying it's a nerdy thing for me. I'm just the type of person who always read books and kind of been curious about a lot of things. And so that's, you know, I, it's, it's, it's a good job. And it's a job that allows you to, to explore your passion, to explore your curiosity, to look at the things that really inspire you. We have a lot of people in this group, uh, not in this group, but are in our audience and people listening in and others who'll be listening to this as a recording later on, who probably been out of school for a while. Like me, I was actually uh, out of school for quite a while before I uh, pursued my PhD. I am an older uh, professor. I started in my early 40s. And so I had worked in the field. And so when studying as a, as a doctoral student at that level, it's really neat because I can draw upon my work experience and the stuff that I actually use when I teach my courses. And so a question for you, how does your prior work experience, especially for those who uh, are working and considering changing a career as a professor, how does your prior work experience help you prepare for a PhD and those for practicing? How do you use it today in your work? And I will start with Deanna this time. Thanks, Joe. Uh, so I, I do tell stories. I didn't have a long work uh, interim between going from my undergrad to my PhD. It was about four years, but it was still enough that I have stories about those project management teams that did well and some that did not. And I have stories about managing inventory. So when I teach those classes, it's really relevant. And I talk about it, but I do teach other classes. And, and in those classes, I bring in case studies and speakers that have those experiences. Um, but I, I will say, so, you know, I did say I spent four years in between, but there were um, uh, other PhD students that had come straight out of school, some, and, and then other students that had much more experience than I did. So I was kind of right in the middle of the pack uh, in my group. Jason, your turn this time. <laughs> All right. So in, in teaching, I've really find that I can draw upon my experiences to share the stories. It just helps so much to anchor the, the content, the course content in a story, in an example, and it makes it just so much more tangible to share with students, um, especially if students have a relatable story or something that they can share. But I've also found that it has really helped inform my research questions also. And so, you know, you read something uh, on a, from a paper and then what, if you can connect that to a story or an experience, again, it makes it more real. And you can kind of help poke holes in, in these theories and, and ask uh, additional questions, maybe unthought of questions. And so uh, very vaguely, very broadly, all of my prior work experience has helped shape my teaching and my, my research. Stephanie? Um, my prior work experience is directly relevant to what I do because I worked in services and I teach services and I also um, work in analytics and I teach analytics, but I also think having professional work experience um, is very helpful in a university environment because, you know, you kind of, you kind of know what is going on outside. Um, and I think that is really helpful for um, preparing students for entering the workforce. And a lot of us um, still do consulting work. So I do consulting work still outside of the university and I try to stay relevant with different skills. And so I, I do feel like I have a skill set that's transitionable out to the professional world. I just choose that I want to stay where I'm at. But um, my past experience, I, I definitely think it helped me. And I was in the same position as Deanna. I worked for about 10 years, but one of, I had three people in my cohort that when we came in, one person came straight out of undergrad and was deciding between law school and a PhD in business. And he chose this and he's doing great. And then my other cohort member had worked for about almost 20 years um, in banking. And she came back to get her PhD in marketing too. So I was kind of in the middle of a pack. I think it, I think it really helped, but I don't think it's, you know, it's necessary, not necessary, but it's helpful. Yeah. Thank you, Stephanie. I have one more question and then I'm gonna throw this open to those uh, listening in and watching this uh, presentation. So for those who are listening in and uh, watching the presentation, it's a good time to start scribbling your questions down now. So you'll have them ready to ask and we can 
come up with answers for you. This last question for uh, all of you is, again, for those watching, um, it's get a PhD. Who, me, get a PhD? Can I even do it? And so what are the challenges that you, know, you had to face and overcome to earn your PhD? And this time I will start with Stephanie. You're on mute, Stephanie. There you go, thank you. I promise I clicked it. Okay, challenges. <laughs> um, there were a lot. I mean, leaving your job, you know, where you're getting that paycheck every two weeks and going, you know, back to school, even though they're paying your tuition, I mean, it's a pretty big shift when you're used to having a lot of discretionary income and stuff like that. Um, and also moving, you know, most likely you'll probably move to a new place. Um, I was lucky that I did get, you know, where I got my PhD, I had gone there for undergrad, even though I had moved several states away. So it was kind of like coming home and I was comfortable, but there are some challenges. I think the biggest one is you need to know why you're doing it. Um, when I look around at my, I think about like my first day when my entire cohort, everybody from marketing, management, finance, you know, all of the people, you know, the only people that didn't finish at FSU, other schools are different, but they don't have a model where they're trying to make you leave. Um, and I don't think most schools do, but, um, but the only people that didn't finish were people who weren't sure why they were there. Um, and, and, and that's, that's not a failure on their part. They, they chose, you know, they didn't sit there and just keep doing something that wasn't going to serve them. They decided to take another path. But I, but I think that, you know, if you know why you want to do it, you're going to, you're going to be able to keep those late nights. You know, you're going to be able to manage your time. And I do say this, and I, I think Joe will appreciate this, that yes, you know, there's the quantitative part of the PhD program that is challenging, um, but you also have to be a decent writer. Um, but once you get out, you know, that kind of shifts. But the thing I'll say, I think the hardest absolute part for me is it's the time management. You have to figure out how to do all of the work. And sometimes the, it's not the work, it's the amount of the work. So kind of just planning your time and spending your time um, and, and making sure that you're utilizing all of your resources. So there are some challenges, but they're not things that aren't, that you can't overcome. And the best thing about the PhD project is that you have people that you can call who are not at your institution, who you can call and say, I don't know what I'm doing, right? Like, I feel like I'm failing, right? And they'll tell you, no, 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 you're fine, you're fine. Like, this is normal. You're supposed to feel like that. Um, so it's challenging, but you can do it. Jason? So it's funny, you reference the stability, giving up that uh, paycheck every two weeks. My, I was coming from a solopreneur um, job, and so I had no guaranteed income. And so that was like the comfort of the PhD program, getting that measly stipend uh, every two weeks was like, hey, I, I don't have to worry about, you know, my next meal. I know it's going to be there. It just might be a small meal, but I know it's there. So um, the, the challenging part for me was really the comprehensive exams was like the biggest thing. Um, I, I just built it up in my head so much that it's like, all this time moving across the country, putting in two years, you know, just going at it as hard as I could and taking my whole family here, uh, all comes down to this one exam. Like this seems ridiculous to me. And so I, I built it up in my mind uh, and I poured a lot of energy and a lot of effort into preparing for the comprehensive exam, which I passed so the first, first try. So it was just, uh, but it was seemingly such a big hurdle. Um, and it seemed to be like carried too much weight, but I think maybe that was just my own psychological burden. I was putting so much pressure on myself to get through and I did. So, um, but that was the biggest obstacle for me in this whole program. The hard work, it was nothing new. It was just a different, different beast, uh, but it, it was nothing that you can't manage. You can't push through and work through. And Deanna. Yeah, thanks. The challenges, um, I'd say like uh, trying to be nice about it, but the first couple of years, I actually like, it was a challenge to work with my advisor. Like uh, her work style and mine were not the same. I think I was a little bit more laid back. So, uh, but going back to, you know, what Stephanie said, it's like having that external network to remind me why I was doing this and that it's gonna be okay. 
uh, and going to the Academy of Management, seeing my colleagues at the PhD project where I could complain and complain about everything and everyone, and no one was going to tell anybody that I was working with, you know, um, it was it was what got me through. Um, and in the end, I have a great working relationship with my advisor now that I'm graduated. Uh, it took a couple of years, I think, to to kind of uh, get there, but um, but that was probably the biggest challenge uh, is um, it w for me was was kind of figuring out the working style and of uh, working with my advisor. Um, but I did want to just throw in a couple of other things. These weren't challenges, but they were kind of things that I didn't realize going into my PhD. Um, one was that I think I kind of lucked out in going to the University of, Ma of Massachusetts Amherst that it was a teaching and research school so that uh, students got to teach while, so after your first year you started teaching to get in front of the classroom. And, uh, and they had actually kind of a structure, you would attend the class once and then you became the instructor for that class. And they had PhD students teaching the class. That's not everywhere, not, um, and it's not expected. Uh, some schools expect it, some don't. So that was one thing that, in the end, that's what I wanted to do. And it was just great that uh, I happened into a university that gave me that experience and I could put it on my resume when I went out into the market. Um, and then the other one that I didn't realize, which uh, is actually like once you do get an advisor and different schools do it different ways when you get your PhD advisor. But one of the things I didn't realize was it's not just that you get an advisor, you get their network, like you become part of their pedigree and like who they know all of a sudden becomes like a colleague of yours, right? And some, you know, so you're, uh, it's kind of interesting to figure out like, oh, you know, I work for so-and-so who knows somebody at this school. And so you have these connections at other universities and in other uh, places across the US and the world. So uh, it's hard to explain my colleagues are all like, yeah, I understand what you're saying, but it's hard to explain to somebody that's going into the program what that means. Yeah. Thank you, Deanna. Um, just before we go into questions and answers, I just want to add one challenge that um, it's important to bring up. And my personal challenges, of course, are similar to uh, my colleagues here, as any doctoral student experiences. The PhD project, our support network will help you through that as well as others. But the one thing I, for those who are curious, you know, I'm Native American, I'm American Indian, I'm, you know, tribe, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm Pagani, I'm Kainai, I'm Nimipu. Do I have, I, I don't want to sacrifice my identity as being Native to do this work. How do I, how do I work that out? You, you, you remain being Native. You don't have to sacrifice your identity as a Native person. Matter of fact, bringing in your Native identity is actually going to enhance not just your work and your scholarship, but it's going to enhance your program. And that's the thing that uh, I found very interesting. It was my worries when I entered a program. And I was very blessed that I went to New Mexico State University and I met uh, uh, Professor David Boji. And he is the one who taught me that, you know, be who you are, Rem keep true to yourself. We're going to teach you how to explore things, but you don't have to sacrifice who you are to become a professor. And if you remain true to who you are, you'll be an outstanding professor. I'm gonna leave it open to the floor now. We have only about uh, six minutes according to linear time. If we got into a trickster time, we can keep going forever, but we have to respect everyone's times. So um, are there any uh, questions out there that uh, that uh, I think Christina might have? Uh, there was a, someone asked a question about how long it would take to get a PhD and I answered in the Q&A, but um, I think most of us could, and Jason's actually, <laughs> getting close to being finished, but I think the average is four to five years. Most people, it's four years. Um, mm -hmm. your, Jason mentioned um, your comprehensive exams. I almost just blacked out. I couldn't remember the name of <laughs> Anyway, but um, you know, after your comprehensive exams, you're considered something called, you know, after you, um, I guess after the, the year after your comprehensive exams, you defend your proposal for your dissertation. So then you're kind of considered all but dissertation ABD. Some people, it is not recommended that you do this, but some people for ex, you know, extraneous reasons need to go on the job market at that point, and they do. So that would be three years, but you have to finish your PhD and then you're already on the tenure clock. It's not recommended to do that. Um, so usually it's four years, you go on the market, 
um, kind of at the end of your third year in that summertime, and then you would graduate and take a job in the following summer. So four years is about the average. Does anybody else have a different experience or? Yeah, I, 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 I operated on Indian time. I did a qualitative study. And so what I did is I explored uh, uh, the history of uh, native trade uh, throughout the, the West. And I, so that was historical study, reading journals and literature. I did an anthropological uh, examination, actually went up to uh, some archeological sites and looked at the trade paths that were up there. And that was primarily to get a foundation of historical trade. And then I uh, studied philosophy, whom I studied under uh, Gregor Cajete. And so I looked at native philosophy and the history. And my uh, question was, where does business fit within, uh, native, within native culture? What is our philosophy of business? Being a qualitative study, uh, having to do the historical work, the anthropological work, and then interviewing uh, practicing uh, enterprisers, it took me six years to complete my PhD because my dissertation process, being a qualitative process, uh, took two years. It was a pretty intensive work. Others? Yeah, so um, I'll be graduating in four, and of our cohort in the management programs, uh, I'm one of three, I think, graduating in four. All the rest are going five plus. Um, so it's pretty standard. I think a lot of universities are five plus years now uh, with, with funding, and so it's just, you know, longer time to get your work done. Uh, but our program is four years, and so it depends where you're going, but most are pretty clearly stated in the application process. You know, we have a five-year program. Here's what it looks like. Um, but Binghamton University is a four-year program. Good. Um, I would say, like, don't be scared of five years, because I, I really do think, I did, I finished in four years, and I sometimes wish I had had five, because by the time you get into that fifth year, you're kind of ready to start sending papers out and getting published, and it actually will help you place into a better academic position when you come out because it gives you more time to get published. So if you're kind of thinking, oh my gosh, I can't do that for five years. I, I mean, I think that it actually gives you a longer runway um, and the publishing process for, you know, PhD, it takes a long time. So I don't, don't be scared by five years. It goes by really fast. And honestly, it's still, it's, it's, it's kind of like, you know, if you were, if you enjoyed your undergrad, like, you know, or that time, you know, in that life, in your life, when you get to explore something so freely, I mean, that's what you're doing. So it's not, um, your life is not on hold. You're still living your life. Um, one thing that came up a question that here is, you know, can I afford to get a PhD? Um, actually, surprisingly, uh, a lot of people don't know this, but PhD programs, uh, as a doctoral student, you kind of become an employee. Uh, there's tuition waivers for doctoral students. Um, there's uh, for those who get the opportunity to teach or do research assistantship, there's funding. So surprise, you might be surprised to find out that it's really not that expensive to get your PhD. Again, at this level of study, you're not truly a student per se as you are an apprentice. We're teaching you to become a professor and therefore just like any other apprenticeship programs, you know, different schools provide different support. And this is something you need to explore with the schools that you're interested in. Um, got about one more minute for another question and then I, we're going to close about, you know, about what, what are the next steps for those who want to join us? And I'm going to share more about that in a little bit. So any final questions that we have? And there, yes, if for those, it's, it's great. You can do this with a family. Um, I, you know, I had two young children. My children basically don't know dad as not being a professor. And it's kind of fun. They, it was my son mentioned that one of his friends found out that uh, I was a doctor and she was quite surprised and she said to my son, why didn't you tell me he was a doctor? And he said, told you he was a professor, duh. And so that's the kind of environment my children grew up in is that they don't see, you know, they don't see dad as, you know, anybody other than dad. And so uh, for those who want, you know, in terms of lifestyle, it's, a, it's, it's an environment that'll help develop the future generation. And hopefully they too will follow your footsteps. Um, Let's see, there's loan forgiveness program. So other things that are answered in here. I only got a few minutes. So why don't we just talk about what are the next steps for those who want to join us, want to go to the next thing. We have this conference and we can, and we could, you could spend a couple of days with us learning much more about this in detail. And it's what I call Chicago or what the PhD project calls the annual conference. And we, you apply to the conference and there is a registration fee for it and a little bit more on the detail on that. But this is what happens. 
to in order to be eligible to participate in this conference, which teaches you how to be a professor and how to get into a school, you need to be a Black, African American, Latinx, Hispanic American, or Native American, Alaska Native. You need to be a U.S. citizen or a permanent permanent U.S. resident. Uh, in your senior year of college, if you are an undergraduate or, or possess at least a uh, bachelor's degree, an undergraduate degree. So to apply for the conference, and this year it'll be on November 17th, the 19th, 2021 in Chicago, Illinois, the great Chicago conference. Um, you go to phdproject.org, that is phdproject.org. More information is there. You need to apply by September 30th. And the process actually is very similar to applying to a PhD program. We're gonna, you, it, it's already a chance for you just to get the practice to apply to a program. And you'll see that in the application. Well, they're reviewed by heads of doctoral programs and you're selected to attend the conference. If you are selected, it is $200 uh, in person, $50 of virtual and the thing is, is that if you get into a AACSB accredited business doctoral program, and that's important, this thing called the Academy of Business Colleges, you need to be in an accredited program, we give you your money back. So basically think of it as a deposit, as a guarantee, as much for yourself as anything. If you are really into this and you are willing to, and can you know, pay for $200 up front, you'll get it back later if you fulfill your promise to yourself to get into a business program. Okay, registration fee is $200, but if you are a full-time student, we'll waive that registration fee. And at the Chicago conference, we're gonna teach you everything. First, we're gonna teach you what does it mean? What does it mean to hold a PhD? What does it mean to be a nerd with a license? It's not a super MBA, it's a whole different world. As I like to tell um, a lot of people, when you become a PhD student, we're gonna unscrew your skull set the top aside, you're gonna take a big giant scoop and toss out a chunk of your brain and we're gonna put a whole different chunk inside. You're gonna see the world much differently than you would have beforehand. And we'll teach you a lot more about that at the conference. And the key thing that uh, the project also helps you with is that we introduce you to other faculty, practicing faculty. You get a chance to meet some of us in person, ask questions, and you get to meet schools that are looking for doctoral students and they're very excited to bring you on. So on behalf of the PhD project, um, you can visit our website at these different uh, places. So on, on behalf of the project, I'm you know, Dr. Joe Gladstone, and thank you for your attendance. If there's anything for the others to say, this is pretty much our, uh, this is it for us. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thanks, sir. I think we still have uh, a few more minutes. I just wanted to say is, $200 and it's a life-changing experience. At the, the very worst case scenario, you have a $200 trip to Chicago. They pay for your hotel, they pay for your flight, they pay for all the food and it's you know fine dining. Uh, and you get to meet lots of different people from all different backgrounds all around the country. So worst case scenario, it's a $200 trip for a three day paid vacation to Chicago. Uh, and that was the hook that, that got me into this position today. Uh, I got a postcard the year I graduated from the MBA program, threw it away. The next year, I got that same postcard from the PhD project, and it sat on my counter for a few weeks. I thought, no, not, not doing it. Third year, they sent me that same thing, and I said, okay, it's a $200 trip to Chicago. What's the worst that could happen? And here I am in the PhD program. So the marketing is working from the PhD project. Those postcards are effective. Uh, and it's amazing what you learn, the connections you make. And so invest in yourself. It's just $200 and you get it back if you join a PhD program. And like I said, worst case scenario, you had a good trip. So I highly encourage you to go check it out. You can add one more thing because Chicago is just the first step. You get in Chicago, you get into a program and you join what is called a DSA, a Doctoral Student Association. We have them for the different disciplines. We have them for management. 
We have them for marketing. We have them for accounting and information systems. And you get your trips to your annual disciplinary conference paid for room and board. And so if you have a paper to present, you want to expand your knowledge, you get to go other places. You know, and these conferences are worldwide. I do recall uh, one year, I think it was information systems had their conference in Chile. And so a PhD project paid for people to go down to Chile for their conference. And so the DSA, uh, the, the Chicago conference is just the first step, just to get you into a doctoral program. The DSAs, that's where the action's at. That's where you learn the was how to be a professor, how to succeed through a doctoral program. You make friends. That's actually where I met Deanna. Deanna and I have co-authored a lot of the things together. She talked about, well, you know, I like the numbers, inquisitive stuff. And just a joke, we were talking about research and she kept on saying, well, how are you going to study that? How are you going to explore that? And my default line is, I have Deanna. And so that's <laughs> the way this works. And so join us. It's going to be a life-changing thing through your doctoral student studies experience. You'll get a chance to travel, if that's your thing, on the PhD project's time. And then greatest thing is you get to become a professor because I have students who I brought into this project and watched them grow from being a first-year doctoral student and to becoming a professor. Any other last words other than I that? The other thing about Chicago is that you will leave there knowing whether or not you want to do this. I know that sounds kind of like profound, like how is that possibly gonna happen in two days, but you will. And I know like when I went, I remember I was so scared, didn't know anybody, you know, I was rooming with someone I didn't know. She's now on faculty at Duke and she's amazing. And, um, you know, I, I went to that first dinner that night. I still was like, what's going on here? And then the next day, I remember when it was over, they played, um, this Gloria Stefan song, you guys know, at the end, they play it. And I was like crying. I was like, I'm going to do this. So if you aren't sure, and I know we couldn't answer everybody's questions, and you probably have a lot, you don't have to know anything to go. That's the whole point. Just go. If you enjoy it, and you want to pursue it, then you're going to know you're going to meet a bunch of people. And if you get there, and you're like, absolutely not, this isn't for me, well, then at least you know, and then you can go you know, at least you met a few people and you went to Chicago. So I would just challenge you to take the time for yourself to do it. I went into the Marine Corps and it was an expense paid trip to San Diego and they shaved off all my hair and made me stand in yellow footprints and yelled at me for three months. Here, you pay 200 bucks. We're not going to yell at you. As Jason said, we're going to feed you quite well and we're going to teach you something just basically for me, it was my doctoral experiences was as intellectually challenging as the Marine Corps was physically challenging. But at least you get to keep your hair. You don't have to stand on footprints. And if you change your mind, you can go ahead and live your life. Okay, uh, Christina, I'm gonna turn it over to you for any final things. You have all done an amazing job. Thank you so much for joining us today. And with that, we will have a playback available and we will send that out to you all via email. Thank you, have a wonderful day.